Welcome to Masters of Engineering, cool products, the people who develop them and how they do it. Today's focus, startups, product development at startups, and we have an expert in product development at startups. Seda Evchemin is a mechanical engineer, public speaker, influencer in hardware development and manufacturing. She's advised a ton of startups in a whole range of different industries on how to build products. She's a mentor and coach, and recently founded her own startup advising and coaching company, Pratik. And she's been an all-star mentor in residence at Techstars, and her own podcast is called The Builder Circle, aimed at helping hardware entrepreneurs and builders and engineers with modern products and system development. She brings a broad range of experience. I'm sure we're all going to learn something. Welcome to the podcast, Seda. Thank you so much, John. It's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you for that introduction. I feel like I'm not worthy. I, I'm so excited to talk to you because I think these days, everywhere I go, people are, are there are a lot of companies that are startups or everyone wants to know how to work like a startup. Mm -hmm. How did you get into advising startups? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, when I started my career journey, I ended up, uh, I would say not completely intentionally, but going into, I, I worked in a, a space startup uh, working on CubeSat satellites. And then I went to a consumer electronics startup and I started working on uh, just like bracelets and mass production. And then from there, I went to uh, Fusion Energy and I uh, I worked at um, Commonwealth Fusion Systems um, on their very novel kind of technology. And while I was at uh, CFS, I the entire kind of uh, process to getting into mentorship and advising was incredibly serendipitous. It was not intentional, really. Mm -hmm. um, what happened was I went to a, a startup launch uh, party and it was someone, uh, a previous mentor and manager of mine that was starting a new company. And he was uh, he was throwing a party and like uh, invited a lot of people in the Boston ecosystem to that. And I ended up meeting the managing director and the program director of Techstars Boston. And I, yeah, and I, I got to just chat with them. And afterwards, I really um, got along uh, with the program director. Um, her, her name's Jennifer. She's amazing. And um, I just, I kind of asked her if she'd be willing to do a Zoom call so that I can learn more about Techstars because I felt like what they were doing was very interesting. They worked with a lot of early stage companies and I was very interested in early stage startups rather than later stage startups. And as I talked to her, I realized that I was continuously talking about my hypothesis of how startups can be better and what they fail at and what I've seen they fail at the most. And that resulted in her asking me to apply to be a mentor. Um, and the rest is kind of history. I ended up mentoring for Techstars Boston. I got connected to Techstars Paris, which is their sustainability hub. So they work more on hardware. Um, and then the Paris office really liked me and they asked me to be a mentor in residence. And then they, um, I guess, pitched me to uh, Techstars headquarters to be an all-star mentor. But yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. Okay, so you went from working in startups to tech stars and mentoring through that and then decided to start your own company. Yeah, when I was doing tech stars, I was still working. Um, I was still yeah. working. Um, I, I from CFS, I went to um, Axion Systems working on ion thrusters, and then I was um, at Toyota Research Institute working on robotics. So I was still working a full time job, but doing kind of uh, mentorship on the side. Yeah. So you're not you're not only an advisor to startups, you're a startup yourself. Yes. <laughs> I feel like if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> like a, meta, a meta startup. Okay. And so you said, I, I want to go back to one thing you said. You said you were on the, it sounds like you were on the inside of startups building products. And you said, mm -hmm. you said you, you, you talked to the woman at Techstars because you felt there were these problems that startups have and face and mm -hmm. don't handle correctly. Right. Mm -hmm. Tell, what are, what are the top couple problems that you saw that you, you, it sounds like you were like on a mission to, fix one i feel like people hire too quickly um and that starts to influence their product in a um in a complicated way because i think the baseline of how you start to develop a hardware project is really falling in love um with the problem that you're solving but not the solution and oftentimes 
founders have a very strong hypo hypothesis on the solution and they get a lot of people that kind of emulate the same solution or are in agreement with that solution. And what that tends to drive is kind of um, a very narrow perspective of approach. Uh, whereas if they kind of start more holistically and say, okay, we're going to know every single detail on this, uh, um, on this problem, and then we're going to find a few ways to solve it. And then we're going to get people on board after we've kind of, uh, we've mastered the problem. I think that's a better approach. And I see that kind of happen all the time where it's, and then it becomes a sunk cost fallacy because now they're, um, they've invested so much in one solution and they keep going down that path and they're like, well, we've been doing this for two to three years. So there's no other solution. Whereas, um, that's like the sunk cost fallacy that I like to talk about sometimes of just like, no, it's, if it's not the right wow. solution, it's not the right solution. Yeah. yeah. You get down the line. I actually, I think that's a whole podcast worth of great advice right there. What you say is <laughs> fall in love with the problem. That's great. Like the mission, but don't fall in love with the first solution. I've heard that called concept fixation back when I was taking mm -hmm. engineering design, they said, yeah, you, you tend to, you, you know, you have to think of a lot of concepts and what are, what are some of the other common problems that that you you feel you see one of the thing is um lack of product focus uh i see a lot of startups coming in and they're they have these beautiful pitch decks and they have these beautiful ideas and they're like we have five product ideas and they have all very different applications um or they have like they have different markets that uh they could potentially attack yeah. and I ask them, great, how many people do you have? Uh, and it's usually around five to 10 maximum um, yeah. in the early stages. So what that uh, ends up doing is, so this is kind of the opposite of what we talked about, right? Like there's the, the problem and then there's like one solution. And this is kind of an opposite scenario where uh, there are multiple problems that they like, uh, they want to solve. And then now, now they have multiple solutions for each of those problems, but now they lack focus. Uh, what that causes is for people to uh, spread their team too thin, and then you don't actually get the depth of a product and a market. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Too many products. And may I make a friendly addition that please can also be too many things going into one product. Yes. Like, oh, yeah, well, it's got to have this and this and this. You know, I always say, I don't know if you would agree, but, I, you know, I'm kind of a student of product development because I meet product developers all day. I've been on 40 site visits to product mm. developers this year, our customers, basically. But one of the things I feel is great products are often defined by what they leave out more than what they put in. Because mm -hmm. it's easy to come up with long lists of what to put in. The courageous decisions are what, what do we leave out? What don't we do are the hard decisions. And I think that's consistent with what you're saying about wanting to do too many things and you've got to, you got to narrow it down. Um, mm -hmm. Let's, let me turn to some of the incredible range of products you've worked on. Mm -hmm. Tell me like, Tell me a few, a few of them, maybe map the space from one extreme sure. to the other. Yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. I, I'm happy to. Um, I, I've worked on products such as um, uh, there, there's a company called Tezuda. They're making these um, impact indicator uh, devices that you can uh, pop on a helmet uh, to tell you if you've had an impact that could cause a concussion. Um, wow. the, the CEO uh, of the company uh, she's uh, she's wonderful. She uh, was a rugby player and got concussed and it wasn't identified, uh, which caused her to have a lot oh. of uh, struggle uh, with reading and writing and even speaking uh, for a long uh, reign. So oh. she uh, she really like a, a grassroots effort of a company uh, to be able to build these little impact indicators, super mechanical, nothing electric in it. Um, it's just basically a suspended spring and it's a really smart design. Um, and so I got to work on that as a part of the Techstars Boston portfolio, uh, which was a much smaller kind of device. It's um, it's basically a mass production element. Um, and so I that that's kind of, I guess, like on one end of the spectrum. Um, and then yeah. on the other more, I guess, industrial big uh, equipment side of things, I got to work on um, Fusion Energy, uh, where I was in the R&D team working on uh, the manufacturing, the development of the manufacturing uh, for uh, their uh, superconductor cables uh, that uh, would exist in the solenoids that get put into the magnetic confinement tokamak, which are the uh, kind of keywords. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, cool. yeah. So that, those are kind of like to give to give a range. Um, okay. Okay. Can, can you rattle off just a few more? Because I know it's such an incredible mm -hmm. range that that I've that I know you do, and you probably have many others. I don't know, but can you can you tell us a few more? Yeah. Um, one of the uh, really uh, interesting ones uh, that I worked on through Techstars Paris uh, was a mycelium based um, styrofoam alternative uh, that would basically be used for packaging, but it's completely, um, uh, it, it's a bio created uh, material and it decomposes. So it's, it, it's not like styrofoam um, and it's not toxic. So that was a really interesting, um, very different, more on the, I guess, like chemical processing side of things that I didn't quite know, but I was able to help um, with. This company is um, called S Lab. Uh, they're okay. actually, um, they're Ukrainian founders. Ukrainian. And okay. yeah, they, they are based in Spain. How about one more? One more cool product you've worked one on. What's, more... what's, what's, the, what's one that gets, that gets you particularly or just one more, one more. One cool. more. I really enjoyed working on CubeSat satellites. Um, that was my yeah. my first uh, kind of uh, yeah. first job. And um, it was just an interesting space. I mean, one of the things, and I'm sure that you share this, John, with me, uh, being an engineer yourself, uh, is that I'm also very uh, fascinated by the constraints of an environment that a product is going into. Yeah. Um, so it's it, the the constraints of space is very different uh, than most uh, other I, other products that I've worked in. It's just uh, the amount of vibration that it gets um, into, the amount of how important it is for uh, from an economic standpoint of how light it needs to be, how things just need to really be able to work 100% of the time. Uh, otherwise, you lose your product and you can't go into space and fix it. Uh, so th that was just really fascinating. I got to work on some uh, kind of antenna deployment systems that needed to uh, passively work out of the gate. And if they didn't work, then we didn't have our comms. So stuff like that. It was just really, I, I personally loved working on it. Cool. Well, again, an incredible range of products. Um, what's your approach to advising companies? How do you how do you add value? Is there a common way or is there a broad range of things you do for the different companies you work with? Yeah, I think one of the things that I try to do um, is one, give a, give the founders a chance to really uh, describe their vision, uh, because oftentimes um, that's where I'll, either they they struggle to articulate that or um, there is just, they, they have no idea what the steps are to get there. I think one of the things that I particularly try to help them with is kind of create a procedure um, of what are the next actionable steps uh, to be able to take, um, to make the leap into this large vision. And oftentimes this is another, I guess, um, common pitfall that startups face is that there's, and I actually call it the startup paradox, where there's a lot of stuff to do, but you don't have anything to do today. Uh, because it's the way that I describe it is there's this huge pile of things that need to get done for a vision, like a mountain, and for that vision to actually exist and conceptualize in the world. But because there isn't anyone that's able to kind of put them into small actionable chunks um, of things that need to get done, your day looks like it's empty because you don't know which part of that pile you're supposed to pick from. Uh, so I really, on the high level side of things, I really help them kind of scope those actionable chunks and give them space to be able to get turned into to-do lists that people can do. And then that also gives clarity around skills that need to exist in the in the company for those to be able to get done properly. Because another thing is, a lot of people think that because they're building a hardware product, they need the exact kind of carbon copy of a hardware team of another company that's building something uh -huh. similar. And they end up over hiring either mechanical engineers or firmware engineers. Every single problem and every single uh, company has very different people in it and very different um, needs in terms of skills. So I really try to help them figure out what what the skill um, deficits are so that either in existing employees can be trained or they uh, the positions can be filled systematically in line with the hardware team. That really resonates when you say it. How do you, how do you engage with the startup? Are you a consultant for a short term or long term? What does that look like? 
Yeah, it I mean, it really depends on the startup, I'd say I have the kind of ethical obligation to make myself redundant as soon as possible. Uh, because at the end of the day, startups won't be able to sustainably grow and exist and thrive if they constantly rely on my advice. Um, so I really see it as and that's why I say coaching sometimes because I'm like, I really want to coach people so that they can make decisions for themselves and use the methodologies and the fundamental um, infrastructure that I provide them, uh, but they can do it on their own. So the way that I engage, I usually, um, if it's something that they're struggling with, say it's a uh, kind of like a skill matrix, they're trying to see what their org chart is going to look like. And that's kind of like a higher level um, operational help I give. It's going to be a project based thing. I'm going to do it for them and then I'm going to give my advice and they're going to move forward and um, do really well. Other times, I'm also a mechanical engineer by trade, as you said, and I really love working on um, development of manufacturing processes, which is what I did at, um, at the Fusion startup that I worked at. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I have more embedded engagements where I really... I, I act like, like a partner to a team and I help them uh, kind of develop the processes, find equipment to do it, find the right level of automation if it should be insourced or outsourced, because that's always a tricky decision, too, that a lot of people rush into. Um, and then kind of go from there and really act as an engineer, a uh, technical mentor. And I kind of also do a little bit of uh, just like scope management and kind of go from there. Wow. So pretty broad range. And just to mm -hmm. bound, bound it. Um, what's the shortest, longest average time, you know, cal cl calendar time duration you work with your your clients? Yeah, I'd say I've had ones where the engagement um, completed, like the project completed in a month uh, because it was just uh -huh. a really tight scope. And then uh, other ones where it's more embedded a year, two years, it, oh, it can okay. go, go on for so a bit. Could be could be a month, could be a year or two. Mm -hmm. And how many how many clients are you advising, mentoring, embedding with at any given time? You know, usually I don't want I don't go over three because I oh. feel like if I um, if I do more um, because I, I also one of my um, clients is one that. Uh, gets me uh, in contact with a lot of different startups. So it's actually, I get a lot a broad range from one of my client engagements. Um, and then the other two are more embedded. So I like to focus my time um, and really dive in and not spread myself too thin where I'm not helpful for anyone. So that means your clients get a lot of attention. Seda, um, can you tell the audience quickly, how would they get in touch with you and also how to listen to your podcast? You can listen to my podcast called The Builder Circle. I uh, interview and have discussions with uh, people um, on all of the things that I just talked about and more. Um, and it's uh, it, you can find it on any type of streaming uh, platform. Yeah. And um, in terms of getting in contact with me, uh, you can uh, either directly message me on LinkedIn or you can reach out to my uh, directly to my email, which is S-E-R-A at uh, pratikdev.com. That's P-R-A-T-I-K-D-E-V.com. Fantastic. Okay. You work a lot with, you You focus on startups, but I bet you there's a lot of people who are going to be listening to this who work in larger companies. Mm -hmm. And I find a lot of larger companies talk to me about, hey, we want to work more like a startup. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for people who are out there in a larger, more established company who, for whatever reason, typically agility, speed, innovation, cost savings, they want to work more like a startup. Um, what would do you have any advice to offer our, our listeners in larger companies? Yeah, I think um, in larger companies, oftentimes there is a lot of structure and frankly, bureaucracy in place that uh, really makes innovation struggle. Um, so what I would recommend is if there are any uh, any ways that big companies can create almost, um, I, I want to say, in my mind, I'm visualizing a sandbox uh, where it's kind of a, a, a separate uh, little sandbox organization uh, where the the company is very well aware of the, the risk profile and is comfortable with kind of allocating um, enough funds uh, to be able to take different risks and um, have kind of an agile um, hardware development and testing um, environment where ideas can be, um, seedling ideas could be pitched. But I do think it's more so 
guarding the um, innovation kind of hub with your life to not have the same bureaucratic systems and processes of the larger organization and having that be a protected sphere ecosystem of its own. That's great. If mm-hmm. a larger company came to you after hearing this, Mm-hmm. Said, said, we want you to help us think like a startup internally in one of these sandboxes. Would you consider advising them, mentoring their team? Absolutely. There are very large companies with that's go. There's so much going on for them, and they have the ability to also make a really large impact because they have this built-in megaphone. Um, and I'm also very passionate about uh, making these large companies be able to create this very unique path of impact uh, that they aren't doing it. So absolutely. Let me ask you, you recently spoke at the WEC in Prague, right? Mm -hmm. Could you tell us, tell us what that was about and what did you learn, you know, from, from that experience? So it was actually, I feel like you're going to find the topic really interesting because I know that you think about it too. I talked about AI integration and challenges into hardware development. So yeah, my my conversation there was very much uh, focused on um, what parts of the engineering and uh, hardware development process require are are currently inefficient, and how AI could strategically slot itself in so that uh, we are basically as engineers worrying about harder problems uh, than having to do kind of the busy work and then the the small things. And then also um, inefficient in a sense of, um, I feel like a lot of startups and honestly, even big companies uh, sometimes uh, over test even um, at times. So there are very interesting AI tools uh, now coming about to do some level of uh, virtual testing and virtual parameter parameterization. Sorry, that's a hard word to say. Um, And uh, so that you are more selective with what tests you physically do in the world. Very, very cool. I mean, AI and product design, that is a fascinating topic. Are you seeing any of your clients or prospective clients using AI today in product development in any particular way? I wish there were more. I'm actually, so this is super interesting. On the hardware and mechanical side of things, I see a lot of resistance to uh, transition over to the AI revolution. I think a lot of people think it's overhyped, which parts of it are. Oh, it's um, definitely overhyped. It's overhyped. <laughs> but that's, but that doesn't mean it's not useful. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, well, like the the most common usage that I've seen is just people using note taking um, AI tools in Zoom. But that's not really what I'm personally that interested in. I mean, there's a lot of um, generative like uh, generative design tools that I'm fascinated to see how that works. But the challenges with that that I spoke to was IP and how um how that's going to be taken care of and what kind of governance is going to be put around it so that it's ethical. I'll just tell you that I'm seeing AI used for generating uh, code. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had podcast guests talk about that, which is part of building hardware products, firmware code. Very much so, yeah. Um, uh, And I think that we're seeing a lot of synthetic data generation and public Mm -hmm. data, like the uh, on-shape public model data set, the ABC data set, um, uh, sketch graph. um, uh, There's a um, part assembly uh, database out there. People Mm -hmm. are generating data that don't rely on on, uh, proprietary data. But Seda, I want to thank you for being a fascinating guest. The time has flown by. If you want to hear more from Seda, she only works with three companies at a time, but you could be one of those three. Um, Seda, can you once again tell people, tell our listeners, how would they learn more about you? If you want to visit my website, it's uh, www.com pratikdev.com. That's the same P-R-A-T-I-K-D-E-V.com. Uh, I love the episode of your podcast about Capital Stack. That's one I'll recommend to the audience if they're interested in fundraising. Very interesting and unique framing of the financing problem. So with that, I want to say a big thank you to all of our, our listeners. Um, I'm your host, John Hershtick. See you all next time on Masters of Engineering.